Hi, welcome back to the Genetic Genius Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Lulu. On this week's episode, Hallie Brook discusses the functional medicine model of health and how this approach is a complete holistic model for achieving wellness. Hallie is the founder and CEO of Live Nourished. She is a certified functional medicine nutrition counselor, nationally board certified health and wellness coach, Fox 21 fitness and nutrition expert, and fierce industry advocate. Hallie believes that true health is much more than just exercising and eating. She has come by this truth from her years of education, working with clients, her own health journey, and from building a business from the ground up. As an answer to this problem, she built a thriving functional medicine coaching practice that works with clients in all the key areas of well-being, movement, nutrition, mindset, mental health, resilience, relationships, and self-care. Her life mission is to encourage, empower, and free both men and women through healing. Whether with clients through speaking events or personally with the people she encounters, she lives and breathes this mission day in and day out. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Genetic Genius Podcast. I'm so excited to have my guest today, Hallie Brook. Welcome. Thank you. It's so awesome to be here. I'm really excited. Yay. Today, we're going to be talking all about wellness from the functional medicine perspective and what it really looks like to live this super vibrant life and from the holistic model, which is, of course, one of my (laughs) favorite topics. (laughs) And we're going to be diving into some other fun things, too. So thanks for joining us, everyone. And before we dive into talking about that, Hallie, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit of your background so everyone can get to know you a little bit better? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm in beautiful Colorado. It's fall right now and it's 70 degrees, which is awesome. Total Colorado girl at heart. I'm a mountain biker and a whitewater rafter and I love my dog and that's who I am. I ended up in functional medicine. So I came out of college thinking I was going to do pre-med, ended up going and teaching and teach for America for nine years, taught Mm. math in the inner city for nine years, real hard left turn. And in that process, got super sick myself, ended up with some really gnarly digestive issues that I couldn't find solutions for. And so stumbled my way into functional medicine, looking for answers for myself and absolutely love it. And this is where I'm supposed to be. Went back to school, got a degree in that, and then launched Live Nourish Coaching. And here we are. Nice. Oh, that's great. I love Colorado. That what a beautiful place that you live. That's so nice. And then we live in the mountains here in Asheville too. So we have a different type of mountains, but we have, the, yep. we do have them. <laughs> yeah. Yay. And it's so interesting. A lot of people have the same kind of story where they're, they had some health issue themselves, right? Mm-hmm. Kind of ignited their passion for healing and helping others. So it's really it's a way for us to empathize and sympathize, right? <laughs> yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. We have a joke. Everyone in functional medicine has a story. And <laughs> so here we are. Yeah, totally. That's right. Yes. It just depends on the length of the story, right? Is it an album or a <laughs> chapter? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. And so what is your, what does your practice look like? Can you tell us a little bit about what your practice is in that specific background? Yeah, absolutely. So I am a nationally board certified functional medicine health coach, and then I have nutrition counseling as well. I have three other nationally board certified coaches who are part of my team. And then we also have a functional medicine certified registered dietitian on our team as well. So Mm -hmm. the way we practice is it's really important to us to help people figure out what they need lifestyle wise. So we do, we focus on nutrition because that's what we love and believe in. And then we also do everything else related to lifestyle. So when someone's working on getting well, it matters how much they sleep. It matters the health of their relationships. It matters the amount that they're getting outside, the amount that they're moving their body, they're exercising. And then the really cool connection between having our registered dietitian and our health coach And really any functional medicine practitioner and a health coach is the health coach is able to come in and make what the practitioner, what our RD is saying applicable. Our RD comes in and says, okay, I need you to do this. And then our clients go home and go, oh, how do I do that? And so then our health coaches come in and say, okay, here's the concrete stepping stones that we've put together that you are going to need in order to heal. Now let's walk those out one at a time in a way that's sustainable. So Mm. there might be 
12 things in a plan, but we're going to start with one thing and we're going to work together until that one thing, like drinking more water is normal. And then once that's normal, then we add the next thing. And it's really a combination between the expert and your friend walking alongside you. (laughs) makes us unique. Nice. That's great. And it's so important from that functional medicine perspective, it can be complicated and overwhelming for patients and clients, right? They're like, oh my God, where do I even start? There's so many things. And we have so many things in our mind, our toolbox. And then so we're like, dump them all on there. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So I love that you mentioned that and about building that foundation, right? That stepping stone to allow the patient or client to slow slowly start to move into that place of wellness. Cause if someone is in that chronic state of stress or disease, they, they just like back out. They're like, that's too much. I can't do that. There's no way. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Great. So when you, how did you develop your, the philosophy like around this nourished life and helping really others to really change their view? I think that we're moving into this new state Mm. of living and people having a different view of health. And how for you did, you know, how did you create yours or how did you, oh, this is a different view. That's the norm. How did that happen for you? Yeah, man, that's such a good question. So for me, it really was walking through my own journey and realizing there, there weren't good options out there. And so I had to create it for myself. So I grew up in a family that's super healthy. My parents are from Boulder, Colorado and eating organic, all of that stuff is normal for me. I know how to take walks and and do all the things that are quote unquote good. And then I ended up going through a super traumatic divorce. My husband left, literally just left. Mm -hmm. And it was horrible and awful in every way, shape and form. And I don't believe in divorce. And yeah, I had zero say in the whole thing. And so Mm -hmm. all of a sudden, all of the things that work, all of the things that keep me quote healthy, keep me well, aren't working anymore. I don't even have the bandwidth to, to meal prep or like exercise. My body is so stressed that I am burning. I could eat a bag of chips and I would lose weight because I was so stressed (laughs) and realizing these traditional modalities that I have had at my fingertips since birth, because of the way I was raised, they just aren't cutting it anymore. And then to have clients who are coming to me in similar situations where stress is such a huge piece of what they're dealing with. And for me to say, let's meditate is just laughable. (laughs) Yeah, sure. I'll do that. (laughs) Totally. Just like absolutely worthless. And so for me, it was this process of figuring out, okay, there's a spectrum of illness to wellness. Mm. Health is in the middle. So when I got, when my life got turned up and upside down, I wouldn't say that I was at health. Like I was healthy physically, mentally, but I wasn't well by Mm -hmm. any means. I didn't really even know what well was. And so when my life got switched upside down, I ended up back at, I can't even function. I'm eating smoothies three times a day because that's the only thing I can get down. And so what does it actually look like to live nourished? What does it actually look like to be okay when everything else isn't okay? And that has way more than to do than just food and exercise, right? That's like what we believe about ourselves and how we function and all of these things. And so in this process, little things like I love exercising. That's not an issue for me. It's super fun for me. But when I was going through this process, me going for a run was actually not going to be good for me. What I needed to do was take a nap. Me eating a salad and a smoothie didn't have nearly as many calories as I needed. I actually needed to go eat a burger with cheese because I needed, my body needed that. And so recognizing that what we call healthy, one, isn't a one size fits all two. It's not a one season fits all. And three, like healthy versus unhealthy is just the wrong question. The question is, what are we nourishing? And that's the long answer. And where it landed (laughs) me was what we do with our clients is we ask them that by the time they're done working with us, that they would at least be capable of making a nourishing decision 100% Mm -hmm. of the time. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean eating a salad and going for a run every single day. A nourishing decision means understanding what a burger or cake on your friend's birthday is actually nourishing and understanding that is a nourishing decision. And then understanding that there are seasons of life where you're going to take a nap and you're not going to go lift heavy weights and that's okay. And so helping people understand we can make a nourishing decision a hundred percent of the time. And it has almost nothing to do with healthy versus unhealthy. 
that all came out of my story and me realizing that for myself. Wow. That's super powerful, Hallie, because I really like what you were mentioning about the place of recognizing what nourishment is for you in the moment, right? Because I think that's so many people just lose sight of what healthy is or what nourishing nourishment is to them when in the moment of stress. And I think the pandemic is a complete Mm -hmm. model of what that was for all of us or an example, right? Because everybody, we were thrown into this mountain of stress and the people that I think have come out on the other side of it with success had places of awareness built into their systems. And then the rest of us (laughs) are still Mm -hmm. figuring it out, maybe. (laughs) (laughs) Totally. And it's a process of building resilience. It's Mm -hmm. not just what's healthy or unhealthy. It's okay when something doesn't go to plan. Because let's be honest, if we make it to 30, 40, 50, something's going to not go to plan. (laughs) When something doesn't go to plan, how do we handle it? Mm -hmm. Thanksgiving happens. How do we deal with that with our diet? When we sprain our ankle, how do we deal with that with our exercise program? When our husband leaves us, how do we deal with that with the rest of our life? Like Mm -hmm. we have to figure these things out and build that resiliency. And that's part of what living nourished is. Yeah. So true. And I like what you mentioned too, about food and Thanksgiving, because we do have the holidays coming up and it's a great time to look at your food plan, look at your nutrition and see if you are in some specific, like maybe you're doing paleo or something, how are you going to eat with your family? And I always talk to my patients and I'd love to hear your thoughts about this, about don't be so hard on yourself. (laughs) Now, if it's Mm -hmm. a place where it will make you ill, right? Like maybe if you (laughs) eat a bunch of dairy and then it makes you have digestive digestive issues, maybe that's a different story, but there's a place I think of that finding that fine line when you do go out to eat with friends or you are having a family dinner of not being so hard and so strict on yourself that the fun is left out of the equation. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. It's so important. We talk about the four categories of food. Mm -hmm. So what we talk about is food is energy. So that's obviously calories in calories out, right? Mm -hmm. What the whole diet industry focuses on. It's also information. A hundred calories of Coke is a very different biological message than a hundred calories of broccoli. So it's giving your body different information. (laughs) Yeah. It's medicine. So food is either healing your body or damaging your body. Mm -hmm. Then it's also connection. Food is connection to ourselves, to culture, to tradition, to family. And that category is as equally important as the calories category, as the medicine category. And so exactly what you said, if you are in the middle of a healing protocol and so eating stuffing and mashed potatoes with the dairy. And if that's going to actually (laughs) damage your body, right. Then you need to stay in the medicine category of your food for Thanksgiving and maybe make an alternative for yourself. But if you're typically living on a paleo food plan, you can bring something to Thanksgiving that you can eat for yourself, but you can also plug into that food category of connection and understand that having your mashed potatoes from childhood one day of the year is not going to hurt you and you're going to be just fine. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and it might be more nourishing, like you were talking mm-hmm. about. Yeah. Nourishing your family connection and spirit or bringing something that helps your family to connect with you, like making a dish that might, Hey, try this gluten-free mm-hmm. stuffing or something like that. And they're like, they find out it's the best thing, but experiment, <laughs> that was, yeah, experiment exactly. first, test it out before you bring it to the family dinner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love that connection to you too. You can teach your family about about yourself and what you're learning and totally. Yeah, yeah. So true. Yes. And how does that m- model and the specific functional medicine model really differ? And what's the kind of, it's almost, I think there's the difference, but also the merging of that between the traditional mm-hmm. medical model, like most people are familiar with, and now we're, they're moving into right. a space and time of understanding vocabulary that might've been <laughs> not in their terms before. And what does that look like from that, in that difference? And how can we merge more efficiently those two together? Yeah. Oh, that's such a great question. I love that question. And I always preface that question by saying functional medicine and Western medicine are not antithetical to each other. It's not (laughs) one or the other. Yeah. We desperately need both of them and we need them to integrate. And the more that we can integrate the better, but the way that I really describe that is traditional Western medicine is very problem solution oriented. You come in with eczema, you get a steroid cream problem solution. Another way to say that. Okay. 
What functional medicine is instead of finding a solution to a specific problem, we go back and we zoom out and we say, okay, what's actually going on? And we want to go find the root cause of that mm-hmm. problem. So an analogy I use a lot with clients is it's if you have a fire alarm going off, you don't want to just go turn the fire alarm off and walk away, right? There's right. still something on fire. <laughs> like you maybe actually want to ignore the fire alarm for a second and go find the fire and put it out. And so that's really the main difference between functional medicine and Western medicine is functional medicine is going and finding the fire and putting it out. And Western medicine is typically turning off the fire alarm and something is still on fire. Mm-hmm. Desperately need both. They're so important. And that root cause idea that eczema, psoriasis, acne, brain fog, gas and bloating, indigestion, food intolerances, all of those symptoms, you could go to a gastroenterologist, a dermatologist, all of these things, and you wouldn't actually get to the root cause, which is probably your gut health. If you go fix your gut health, heal that all of these other things go away. That's one of the huge differences. Yeah. That you explained that perfectly. I love that analogy too. That was wonderful because it is true. We, when sometimes we need to have that model where we're like, just in that moment, let's say you had an emergent accident, right? You need to have Mm -hmm. that moment in time where we have to have the fire out right at that moment. But then we, when we have a chronic disease and I love that difference between like how the perspective from the functional medicine traditional model is that when from that chronic disease state, that's when we really have to go in and look at the root cause and be like, okay, this is what's going on in your system. What's what part of your system is out of balance that caused the whole thing to start <laughs> spinning out of control? <laughs> yes. Exactly. Super well said. Yeah. If you break your ankle, don't come to me. I'm not the person. If you need a CT scan, don't come to me. I'm not the person that you need, but if your hormones are out of balance or you eat an apple and just have the worst farts ever, and you can't figure out what's (laughs) happening, then you go to functional medicine. And so we have to pair both together because it's so important. Yeah, so true. And we do have a lot from the naturopathic perspective. We do have a lot of acute medicine. And so Mm -hmm. I do like that piece and I'll, but that's more from helping someone in the acute situation, like a homeopathic remedy, like Arnica or something. Okay. You break your foot, (laughs) you go to the R and then you start all of your naturopathic functional medicine protocol to get your body back on track. So it's like that Mm -hmm. combination of two together that you mentioned, which is so beautiful synergy. (laughs) Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And so when we're, when you're, we're looking at your practice as a functional nutritionist, how does that like really differ than a nutritionist that a regular registered dietitian or nutritionist or traditional, I should say is the word. How does that differ when somebody's coming to see you and maybe explain like what the systematic approach would be about maybe, Mm -hmm. maybe use an example of someone you mentioned um, the, the apple, maybe somebody coming in for digestive issues, how you would address that. So our listeners can understand that functional perspective a little bit deeper. Yeah, absolutely. So part of that answer is it depends on the nutritionist. There's traditional trained RDs and nutritionists who do an incredible job listening to and understanding their clients. And there's also functional medicine RDs and nutritionists who don't. So part of it is finding the right person and finding someone (laughs) who's going to listen to you. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Exactly. A big part of that difference is traditionally trained. And I'll give you an example of a client, but Traditionally trained RDs and nutritionists, the absolute short one-liner, which is terrible and a total gross overgeneralization, but an RD working in a hospital, their job is to give red jello to patients. It's just, it's not helpful and make sure that that patient doesn't get more calories than they need. It's very linear. It's very macronutrient oriented. There might be some micronutrients if they're well-trained or they have, they're not in a hospital prescribing red jello. But it's just, it's really basic. It's food plans. It's this amount of chicken for this many days. Whereas a functional medicine, we're taking a step back. So when a client comes to us, we're doing a 60 minute birth till now health history. So I want to know everything that has happened in your life, not related to food, related to like car accidents or boyfriends or whatever. I want to know your whole health history. And then we're really targeting customized really nutritional therapy that is designed to help that person heal. Another great example, we had a client who came to us who had worked with kind of a traditional RD under her doctor's insurance and hadn't really had any luck. She had SIBO, so small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. That RD had put her on a low FODMAP diet, so low fiber diet, 
which helps someone with SIBO because the bacteria that's in their small intestine isn't fermenting food. And so it's not digesting it. It. And you can survive with SIBO eating <laughs> pasta and you're going to be okay, but you're not getting those micronutrients and you're not actually dealing with the issue, which is, okay, we have bacteria that's in the wrong place. We need that to be removed and get it down into the large intestine. So we kept her on a FODMAP diet for a while, but what we talked to her were things about, I need you to eat every four to six hours. I need you to expand the window in between what you're eating because I need your gastrointestinal tract to be able to have that peristaltic wave, which in layman's terms is that like hungry growl. That's actually <laughs> your body pushing stuff through your intestinal system. And so the other RD hadn't talked to her about that. And so she was eating low FODMAP, but she was eating it all the time. So we weren't mm. getting anything process through. <laughs> exactly. And then we talk about, okay, so the other RD also had her on probiotics which aren't helpful when you have bacteria in the wrong place. So we're, right. you know, probiotics aren't bad, but it wasn't the right time for it. So we say, okay, you need to not be on probiotics right now because what we need to focus on now is starving out the bacteria that's in the wrong place so that once that's then gone, then we can start repopulating bacteria in the right place. And then we can get you off of this low FODMAP diet onto a normal diet because your bacteria is now in the right place and it's going to ferment the right things. But when she came to us, she thought that low FODMAP was the rest of her life. And <laughs> it's just not low FODMAP. Yeah. You should maybe be on for two to three months. Maximum. Yeah. The rest and of your life it. is not, that would be no. her, I think on FODMAPs. I don't think you could really survive on that. No, but that's <laughs> happening. Like in traditional yeah. Western medicine, people are going, oh, FODMAP makes you feel better. So that's mm -hmm. an example of kind of the traditional versus functional medicine approach yeah. to that. Yeah. I've had patients come to me in the same way that similar stories when they've been with the same FODMAP <laughs> story uh -huh. and the patient is just really so overwhelmed they, because it's so restrictive. And for someone that has a lot of different relationships around food, where they have to, especially a lot of childhood relationships around food and trauma yeah. around food, which is often found with gut disorders in my perspective. Mm -hmm. And so then when they're asked to be on FODMAPs, it's just like the worst thing that they could ever be prescribed to do. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Oh, okay. I have to tell you this story just because you brought that up. This is absolutely the most extreme situation we've ever had in terms of childhood trauma affecting your well being. But we had a client who had a ton of gut issues. We were working through an elimination food plan with her and she could not stop eating bread. She had given up everything else. We were working mm -hmm. through this healing program, couldn't stop eating bread. And so our coaches dug in with her about, okay, what is bread? What is that connecting to? And this whole story comes out that when she was nine, she was kidnapped. I kid you not. Yeah. Oh my gosh. For six months and kept under the stairs of someone's house oh, and wow. fed bread. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So a traditional nutritionist going, I just need you to stop eating bread. <laughs> We're never going to get anywhere with that until we can get to that story and help her understand like what's happening in her reptilian brain that's connecting her to bread and then help her find a counselor who can work with us and the nutrition. Cause us telling her to stop bread is going to get nothing, but yeah, that's a huge difference too, is we're looking for those things that are, are causing issues, but aren't necessarily related to a gluten intolerance, right? <laughs> yeah. See, and that's the emotional component too, which is so important about the, from the functional medicine perspective is looking at all, it's not just the physical piece, right? We want to look at all the aspects because it's the emotional component is so huge in our healing. We can't just put it up on a shelf. And, I'll just deal with that later. No, nope. <laughs> yeah, no, it doesn't really work. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> no. And I think that's a piece that is often not forgotten necessarily, but just not addressed in the traditional model. I think they're just, there's not enough time in the visits I think is one piece. And also maybe the training from my perspective, I've had over almost two years of like counseling training. So it's, yeah. I, I want to be able to listen to this story. I love to listen to this story. And that's how we really get to know the patients and clients and help them deeply. Exactly. Mm. Yep. Said. Yeah. yeah. So what type of client is your favorite client to work with the type a personality, the gut health personality or gut health client, the busy moms, what's your kind of like favorite client? Oh, that's a great question. So I love working with moms who are busy and overworked. My favorite client 
of all time. And I feel like she repeats herself because, you know, (laughs) our favorite clients do that, but she came to us. She had three kids, amazing woman and was so tired. It was time to go pick up her kids from school and she couldn't even get off the couch. She was that exhausted. And part of what we do in our program is we have several steps that we take people through. So the first is immediate nutritional rebalancing, which is using some supplementation to go, okay, your body is low in these categories. Let's get them up. And then we have the bandwidth to focus on lifestyle. But she sent me a text probably six months ago saying, I'm so thankful for you. And Mm. this mama couldn't get off the couch before. And now she's training to run a marathon, which is amazing. But I just love that. And I love the clients like moms or business women. I feel like are in a really similar category where they take care of everyone else and have the idea of self-care in their head, but it (laughs) doesn't really ever happen or it does once in a blue moon. And so helping them understand how their bodies function, helping them understand that they can run a business and be a mom of three and do all these things and not feel terrible at the same time is my absolute favorite. I love that. And that is such a category that is so needed. They're the, like you said, like the busy mom, the working mom, but they put themselves so low on the totem pole of care. And I'm always working with my patients about kind of like re-education when it comes to Mm -hmm. self-care. And it's amazing when they finally start to see that light bulb go off. If I just took this amount of time for myself, what could happen? Right? Yes. (laughs) Yes, exactly. And Mm -hmm. repurposing healthcare to help or help self-care to help (laughs) them understand that self-care actually is making yourself a nourishing meal. Self-care isn't necessarily chocolate cake and a bubble bath. That's Mm. a great way to enjoy life, but it's not necessarily self-care. It can be, but it falls more into the category of self-indulgence, which isn't bad. Self-indulgence is fantastic. I think what people get confused on is they treat self-indulgence like self-care, and then they're not actually caring for themselves. Watching binge watching Netflix is fun. (laughs) I do it, but it's not self-care. There's a difference. (laughs) There's a difference. Yep, exactly. Yeah. That's a great point. And what are some, can you give us some examples of what like true nourishing self-care would be first? Let's take that busy mom, the working mom category. What would be some really good self-care examples there? Ooh, that's a great question. So we, it's funny. The first answer is it depends on the person, right? So we talk about (laughs) self-care being everything on the spectrum from having a budget to making yourself a nourishing meal. So I'm trying to think of a great client example because stories are more fun. Ooh. Okay. So we have a client right now who is a business owner and a mom, super busy woman. And we, I was having a conversation with her about the difference between busy and productive. Mm -hmm. And she just had this light bulb moment and said, Oh my gosh, I would rather be busy because if I'm busy, I'm feeling like I'm doing something. And I said, okay, what would it look like for you to not be busy? Is it possible for you to be productive, but not busy? And so we pulled up her calendar on this coaching call and we looked (laughs) through it and we said, okay, what are the things in here that are actually giving you life? filling Mm. your bucket. And there were, there was nothing on there. And then she said, what are the things on here that are sucking life from you? And we were able to identify a handful. And then I said, what if these things, if you took them off the calendar, something would fall apart. Like obviously taking your daughter to soccer practice, that's a requirement. (laughs) We have to Mm. do that. But what on here do we need to not do? And she was able to identify six or seven things that if she took them off her calendar, negligible effect. And I said, okay, what can we do instead? And she, first of all, came up with this whole list of like other things that she could do, paint her house, (laughs) chair, all of these things. And I said, okay, I want you to fill it with something that's not a to-do list. And she was like, oh, Oh. (laughs) okay. And I said, so what would fill your cup? That's not a to-do list. And she said, listening to worship music. I said, Mm. okay, great idea. What else? Spending time with my neighbor. She has a really sweet old lady neighbor. And I said, cool, spending time with your old lady neighbor. What does that do? (laughs) Nothing Mm -hmm. other than fills her cup and fills her neighbor cup. And I said, okay, can you find three spots on your schedule where you can put something that you don't have an ROI on, you don't have a return on investment on. And she did. And the next week I said, okay, how did that go? And she goes, I feel okay. I Mm -hmm. feel normal. I don't feel overwhelmed and exhausted. And I said, okay, so now she has a practice of every week she goes through a calendar and she removes a couple of things and she puts some <laughs> things in and that's self-care. 
going right. and hanging out with her neighbor is self-care. Listening to music is self-care. Gardening is self-care. Fantastic. That's such a great example. It's so true that the difference between that busyness, like filling your schedule and feeling like, oh, I must do something, right? I was at this retreat in June in Costa Rica. And one of the things that the, the guide, the mentor, the teachers that said to me personally was like, you just need a day where you don't do anything. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> that was like so hard for me just to do like nothing. Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> nothing. And I, th- and for me, that's really like self-care where I just don't fill my schedule with something else. Like even the gardening piece, which I love plants, but don't schedule it. But if I, I want to do it, then I can do it. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. Have a day where there's nothing on your calendar and right. it doesn't mean that you're going to do nothing. Exactly. But it means that you get to choose. You yeah. get to show up to that day and decide what's going to actually fill your soul instead of being constantly tied to something. We can go down a whole rabbit trail, but I've recently started practicing Sabbath and it is magical and it makes <laughs> absolutely no sense. So just as an experiment, Friday night at sundown to Saturday night at sundown, we've started putting nothing on our calendar. Our TVs are off. Our phones are off and locked away. We have (laughs) everything, nothing. There's nothing on the calendar. And logically it doesn't make any sense because typically for us, Saturday has been the get things done, get stuff done around the house, do errands, whatever day. And then Sunday is chill, get ready for the week. And Mm. so logically in my head, I'm looking at, okay, I'm taking a 24 hour block of time away from errands and I'm going to do nothing. And somehow I have more time to do errands, (laughs) even though I'm doing nothing. It just, it logically makes absolutely no sense, but I think it's because we as humans are designed to rest and we don't, especially Mm -hmm. in our modern culture where I can connect to Instagram and Facebook and Google and YouTube every moment of every day, when you actually rest, it's challenging, Mm -hmm. gives you time back in some weird inside out way. Yeah. Yeah. So true. I know it is a a strange conundrum, right? You're like, wait, how is this possible? (laughs) Like you guys, it's a a time travel question. I think. Yeah. I lost hours, but somehow how I have more. Right. You gain more. And I think that's almost like from that functional medicine perspective, right? We're like giving, we're giving the space and it's create, creates in the long run, way more space of healing instead of that yes. suppressing and shortening the amount of healing time or expanding that healing time said totally. Yeah. Let's talk about the gut. I know we talked about it a little bit, but it's so fun to talk about. Why do you think from the functional medicine perspective, and we all say that the gut is the root of it all. What's your thoughts about why does everything start there, especially from the nutritional perspective? Yeah, such a great question. I love, so Hippocrates 2,500 years ago, whatever said all illness starts in the gut. And we now have the research to back it up. If only we'd been listening to him for 2,400 years. (laughs) Right. What would our life be like? (laughs) What would our life be like? So why is gut health so important? The first reason is our gut lining. So when we talk about gut, I'm typically talking about large intestine. Obviously it's stomach, small intestine and large intestine, but our large intestine is where most of the bacteria lives. It's where all of the things happen and that gut epithelial lining. So the quote unquote skin that makes up your gut is one cell thick which is crazy when you think about the thickest, right, the thinnest so nice. part of skin on your body, like your eyelid so thin is 30 cells thick. So put that in perspective, your gut, your gut is one cell thick. And so it is so easy to poke holes in that, to rip holes in that, to have your type gap junction proteins disengage with each other. Yeah. And what happens when that happens is now we have to make it really layman's terms, food particles and poop particles leaking out into our body really gross. Super gross. And then yeah, it's <laughs> gross to think about. And then what happens is our immune system freaks out and starts attacking that a virus. So just to really dumb it down, how do you feel when your immune system is attacking something like a flu or a bug, you feel sick. You don't want to eat things. You feel tired. You feel brain foggy. Okay. So now your immune system is attacking things three to five times a day. Every time you eat, We have a serious issue that is related to all these other things. We, we know now that when a fetus is developing, obviously a fetus starts with just two cells and then starts to expand, but as cells start to specialize, we know that the specialization of cells that create our brain is the same specialization of cells that create our gut Mm -hmm. gut brain access is absolutely true and a fact and we have research to back that up. So when we're dealing with things like anxiety and depression, 
we now know 95% of our serotonin is created in our gut. So we're treating depression with serotonin uptake reinhibitors, which means whatever is in your body, we're just create, letting your body not reabsorb it, but mm -hmm. we're treating that like a brain problem. And actually it's a gut problem. If you right. are mm -hmm. dealing with depression, your gut's not creating enough serotonin. So what needs to happen to fix that? And then we can go on and on, but <laughs> <laughs> that epithelial lining, how thin and delicate it is and what our microbiome, that globule of bacteria in our guts do for us is we'll be spending the rest of our lives learning about that. Another crazy <laughs> fact is humans are a hundred plus or minus a hundred billion human cells. We're 700 trillion bacteria cells. So as mm. humans, we're actually more bacteria than we are human, <laughs> which is crazy. Right? It makes sense that we get a lot more traction in our well being when we treat the bacteria instead of treating the human cells, because it's the bacteria that turns out is really in control. Yes. Who's in control? <laughs> bacteria. Yeah. I think I might need to be a bacteria for Halloween. <laughs> That's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it would be a fun costume for sure. It would be. <laughs> yeah. It's so true. The gut is so important. And I love that you brought that piece up about the gut and the brain connection, because it's amazing from that traditional model, how many things are just given when it comes to mental health. And we're seeing, uh, extremely seeing how society is having effects from taking antidepressants. We're just seeing, they're like giving out like candy instead yeah. of really addressing the root cause of what's going on, looking at the whole system. And I see a lot of patients in that realm. And I'm always just shocked yeah. when they, and they feel horrible. It, it, they never yeah. feel better when they're on antidepressants. They, it's like, maybe they don't quote unquote feel depressed, but the rest of them feels horrible. It's right. like they can't sleep or they can't eat or they have nausea or, and like you said, it's all coming back to that gut piece. And I wonder what will happen when that shift <laughs> occurs in all of society, <laughs> right? Yes. Like, oh yes, the gut is actually, because the studies have been done, but the, I don't know, the model is not, has not caught up with it yet. Maybe that's our role. <laughs> yeah. Yep, yeah. Totally. <laughs> for sure. And so when people are coming to see you, do you do lab testing for gut work? How does that look for you when you're working with a patient? Let's say someone came in with depression, and you're working on helping with a gut serotonin. Do you do specific gut panels to look at gut bacteria or how does that work in your practice? That is an outstanding question. So our RD can run tests when we need to, we don't typically run tests right out of the gate for a very specific reason. So we do that full intake and then a week of tracking and then a functional medicine game plan. Mm -hmm. We found that with 90% of our clients with the food mood poop journal and with understanding their health history, we don't need an $800 microbiome lab exactly. to figure out what's going on. Insurance almost never covers kind of functional medicine labs. A lot of testing that is helpful, things like micronutrients and all of that, we can typically get done through someone's PCP covered under insurance. And so when we need something like that, we will do something like that. But I think, you know, there are labs out there that let you test your microbiome and they're super cool. But what we can do from reading someone's food, mood, poop journal is we can say, okay, this is what's happening. And then typically when we're working with someone, we don't need labs and they start getting better. The only time we ever will go pull some of those more expensive specific labs mm -hmm. is if we've been working with someone for six months and they're not getting better or they're not progressing the way we think they will, then we go and pull those labs. But it is a very rare case that we have to do that. I'm a scientist by nature. I love data. I love all of that. And I also think a big part of the difference between functional medicine and traditional medicine and just traditional living is we as humans have so learned to outsource our whole well-being mm -hmm. to something else. We outsource our calorie counting to an app. We outsource our exercise <laughs> to a program. We outsource our mental health to our meditation app. Like we just mm -hmm. outsource everything. And so we've lost touch with how our bodies are actually functioning. So for an example, with that, with the microbiome lab test, if someone's dealing with constipation, they very likely have methanobacter or methane producing bacteria that's causing that. I can get an $800 test to prove that, 
or we can start working towards starving out that methane producing bacteria and improving the balance of their gut and that'll work. And we just saved them $800 and having to ship their poop via FedEx. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a long answer to that question. We do use labs when we need to, but we're really picky and we're really specific about when we do to teach people how to internalize their own well-being and to save people a ton of money that they don't need to be spending. Yeah, I think that's so important. And that's a huge way that I practice too. I always look at, would my treatment plan or protocol with a patient change with a lab, yeah, right? And exactly. if it would be exactly the same, I won't do the testing. Most of the time when I do testing is for hormones because I'm mm-hmm. being to see where the estrogen is, where the progesterone is, the testosterone, the cortisol. I need to see it for some particular perspective there. That's what yes. I'm, I'm usually testing for. But that's still, sometimes I don't always do that. It's really, like you said, individualized. Yeah. But we want to make sure that the patient, I love what you said about them learning that it's to the tools to take care of themselves, to learn how their body communicates, to say, Hey, you, we don't need to do that test. Let's see if we can do some things first to teach you this, the docere and naturopathic medicine doctor is teacher, teach you the tools yes. to learn about yourself instead of it being like, let's just look at numbers. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Let's outsource one more thing. Yeah. Right. To something that you don't have control over. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, totally. I love that you talked about that. And So when you're, if you're not using a lab test, and I think you already said this too. So how do you determine if the gut is the real issue then for looking at the root cause and we're really diving Mm -hmm. deep in and you're not doing quote unquote lab testing, which (laughs) I'm like being the patient like for a moment. Totally. Yeah. So great. Yeah. So, you know, so Hallie, how do you know that my gut is an issue if you're not going to do a lab test? (laughs) Yeah. That's a fantastic question. So part of that answer is we know what the research says. We know that research says this group of symptoms is tied to this root cause. This group of symptoms is tied to this group cause. We know if someone's cortisol and adrenals aren't functioning well, we're going to see this group of symptoms. If someone is dealing with skin issues and gas of bloating, we're going to see this is the root cause. So it's all research-based and research-tied. We're not just making it up and <laughs> shooting from our hip. We're right. using, yeah, we're using research and we're using, we're using research and we're using best practices to determine that. But the other truth is there really are only a handful of root causes. Right. Um, <laughs> there are a myriad of symptoms, yes. but truly root causes are going to be gut dysfunction. It's going to be hormone dysfunction. It's going to be thyroid and or adrenal dysfunction. And then a lot of functional medicine practitioners say it'll be inflammation, but I actually think inflammation is a secondary cause. It's not Mm. really a root cause because something is causing that inflammation. (laughs) So really when we think about it, there's three or four things that we can go after. And that's partly what makes it so peaceful for a client is we're not going to go play whack-a-mole with symptoms anymore. <laughs> we're right, going to exactly. say all of these symptoms are coming from this one thing or these two things. And we're going to go mm. over that. So yeah, yeah. How do we determine that without test is we're sitting down with our clients for 60 to 90 minutes. And we are going through the entire functional medicine matrix and all of the questions right. and their whole health history. So by the time we're done with them, we have 10 times the information about them that eight lab tests could give us. Um, <laughs> yes, exactly. And I think that's, or never yeah, give us. <laughs> that could ever give us. And I think that's also a huge difference between functional medicine and Western medicine is Western medicine just doesn't have time to actually right. figure out what's going on. And so why our lab tests are go-to because they're fast. Someone can walk into my office. They can say, I'm dealing with headaches. Great. Let's run a lab test and you're out of my office in 15 minutes versus me sitting down and going, okay, when do those headaches start? What are they linked to? When did they start? Oh, interesting. They started after a car crash. Huh? Okay. Let's talk about that. It's, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's a wonderful point. And I think that will change that model. It has to change because it's a broken model. And so, yeah, we're seeing it slowly evolve and change hopefully faster than yeah. it is. But yeah, I think that is a really big piece is that they're the time factor and that will need to be I don't know how we'll see how it evolves, how it changes. We don't really know. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Yeah. We'll, we'll see how, what it turns out. And so when we're talking about doing, you're figuring out, let's start talk about the same kind of thing again, the gut is the issue. And then, so what would be some of five like gut healing foods that you would recommend mm. to someone that's really wanting to, maybe they're just having, maybe we should pick something. Let's talk about constipation. That's cool <laughs> because that is very yeah. common. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So uh, how, what are those five kind of foods that someone could start to bring into their nutritional plan to really start to get the gut moving and heal the gut to help with the constipation? 
Love that question. So dealing with constipation, goat milk kefir is going to be your best friend. Mm. Every ancient culture around the world has some sort of fermented milk and goat's milk kefir is outstanding compared to yogurt. Yogurt usually has two to three bacteria strains in it. Kefir has 40 to a hundred. Wow. Absolutely. I've had people who couldn't poop. We started them on kefir and they're fine. So goat's milk <laughs> kefir specifically, it's an acquired taste, right? Mix I love it. it. <laughs> yeah. Or just shoot it medicinally, but goat's yeah. milk kefir is outstanding. People with constipation are often told to eat more fiber. What they're not told is there's a difference between prebiotic and probiotic fiber. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah. Eating more prebiotic fiber is super helpful. The best vegetable that has the most prebiotic fiber that I know of is jicama. Mm. Awesome. Make some jicama sticks with some lime juice and some chili salt. Mm. Eat a half a jicama a day. Very likely problem solved. Magnesium is huge. If it is an issue with methane producing bacteria that's slowing down the motility of that gut, magnesium is an amazing mineral that helps soften stools and helps make that motility fantastic. It's also a really hard mineral to overdose on. Mm -hmm. You'll know that you've taken too much when you get diarrhea. So exactly when you get diarrhea, take a little less. Yeah. Your body um, talks to you. <laughs> yeah, totally. But you're not going to get to a toxic level of magnesium. So magnesium is an outstanding stool, stool softener. Magnesium oxide is the best for stool softening, mm -hmm. but it doesn't really boost magnesium levels in your body. So a magnesium citrate or a magnesium glycinate are going to be better. Okay. So kefir, jicama, magnesium sounds super weird, but less things like kale and more things like broccoli. <laughs> yeah. Think robust vegetables broccoli, cauliflower, kale is great. It's a lot of water. Cucumbers are great. It's a lot of water. So cruciferous vegetables are going to be your best friend when you're trying to mm. deal with constipation and then high fiber fruits. So avoid bananas, love bananas. They're awesome. They tend to add to constipation. So if you're a banana a day kind of person, <laughs> switch to an apple and eat it with the skin on mm -hmm. apples also have outstanding prebiotic fiber in them. And they'll help move that stuff through. That would actually be a fun experiment. I would love for someone to text me, do all five of those things for a week and tell me if they're pooping every day. I'm sure they would. <laughs> yeah. that would yep. Yes. That would be definitely one that would work. <laughs> yeah. I love and it is, oh, yes. It's so satisfying when you get that poop. That's like the perfect poop in the right. toilet. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Good. We have a history of constipation and we were talking earlier about the trauma from childhood. And what I see with patients that have had constipation for 20 or 30 years, it's usually from some kind of trauma where they yep. were like, I don't, we don't need to go into it all, but yes, yep. some type of food trauma and then, and not then learning how to have proper poop hygiene. And so it's like retraining the bowel system and then also retraining their habits. What are some yes. of your like habit retraining when it comes to constipation? Ooh, that's a great one. That's a great question. Habit retraining. One of them is drinking more water. If you don't <laughs> yes. have enough, water. yeah. if you don't have enough water, <laughs> you don't have enough to flush all that stuff out. So I have my clients buy a big 42 ounce water bottle and yeah. their goal is to drink that two to two and a half times a day. And most people, I had one client who was dealing with serious constipation. I asked her how much water she drank. And she goes, does LaCroix count? And I was like, how much LaCroix are you drinking? No. She goes, usually in a day, I drink two to three cups of coffee and a couple LaCroix. And I was like, how, and that's it. <laughs> how are you still alive? <laughs> Don't understand. That, yes, that would kill you. <laughs> or that, yeah, you. I, that's why you have constipation. <laughs> exactly. I don't understand how you're 39 and still living, but anyway, habits of drinking more water. And for some people it's filling that water bottle, drinking the whole thing before lunch, drinking another before right. dinner and then being done. Or for some people it's getting a big thing with a straw because straws help us drink more water, but the habit of drinking more water is great. Switching out the habit of what you go for in the kitchen when you're hungry for a snack, getting aware of, okay, when I'm hungry and I walk into the kitchen and I just open the cabinets and blankly stare, what do I usually end up with? And a lot of times for people with constipation, it's things like potato chips, granola Dry bars, or, foods. <laughs> yeah, power bars. And I said, okay, can you intentionally make a switch in your head? So when you are hungry and you walk into the kitchen and you're staring at the cabinet, can you go, Ooh, I'm hungry. I'm going to eat something that's nourishing for myself and grab an apple and almond butter mm. or jicama and hummus, something like that's moving in a different direction. So getting aware of what your go-tos are and then changing what your go-tos are 
those are two huge habits. And then another one that we teach people is getting moving. You can get up in the morning, no kidding, and do five minutes of abs, especially twisting abs, Russian twists, Mm -hmm. overhead lifts, plank with hip dips. If I have people doing the right things, kefir, jicama, all of that, and they're still not pooping and we can get them to do five minutes of abs in the morning, they'll usually poop within an hour of that. Getting (laughs) that body moving and twisting Mm -hmm. obviously is good for calorie burn and transverse abdominals and all of that, but abs are good too. So water, trade out your snacks, twisting abs. Love it. I <laughs> love those. Those are great. Yeah. And it's super important because we're looking at the whole picture when it comes to the gut It's and the whole body in general, but I think it's such a great way. Thanks Hallie for just helping people to see the listeners to understand that we're it's multifaceted and even just like yes. talking about something simple, even though constipation is so important for the system to have the exit of materials, yeah. even getting something as simple as constipation, quote unquote, resolved but healing that piece of the body can do like the most amazing thing ever for your body. (laughs) Tons of things. It's interesting too. You talked about hormones Mm -hmm. and a lot of times. So part of the way that our bodies are getting rid of extra estrogen and phytoestrogens, all of those things is through our poop. And so if we're constipated and our poop is sitting in our large intestine, which is where our body absorbs everything, it's reabsorbing all of those wasted hormones that our body was trying Mm -hmm. to get rid of. And that's huge. A lot of times, if we can get someone unconstipated, we see dramatic changes in their hormone. So true. And it's also with pharmaceuticals when people are taking a lot of, or hormone replacement therapy, even they're taking these things and they're staying in their system and then they're building up and they're feeling a lot worse over time. Yeah. Yeah. Gut getting your gut moving is so important out there. So important. <laughs> so important. Get moving. Get moving. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Hashtag get moving. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna start using that. That's right. awesome. Yeah, totally. Oh, thank you so much. That was great. I really like that because it felt like really a piece of a whole piece for us to talk about, like the whole perspective to really understand all the pieces of functional medicine. And the, I liked how you brought in also the different supplements just really, because that's another piece too, that is lost. I think from the traditional perspective, they're not trained, which is understandable, but there's so many pieces that we can help with like magnesium, vitamin D, and we don't necessarily have to do the testing for those. We can, but we can know the signs and symptoms, like you said, which I think is a really important piece of how we heal from the functional medicine perspective. Let's look at the whole body. Exactly. How you doing out there? <laughs> yep. How you doing? <laughs> How's it working for you? Yes, totally. As we're wrapping up today, I would love for you to just like backtrack for, to the busy mom perspective. Yeah. And do you have a piece that you would like to share in, in helping our wonderful moms out there moving in through the holidays about how they can really embrace the, like a mindset piece or a healing self-care. I know we talked a lot about that, but I think that because the holidays are coming up and it's so busy, like October and then it's January. (laughs) Yes, literally. (laughs) It's like there's not in between and how we talked about how the importance is for the busy moms. So what is a piece that you could suggest that they could take in for that really deep mindset to really set them, Mm -hmm. whether that's nutrition, maybe sitting down with family for dinners, whatever it is, something that they could take that one piece away to, I'm going to do this during the holidays to help my body. Yeah. That's such a great one. I would say, start asking yourself the question, what am I nourishing? Get used to asking yourself that question. If you're eating cake, what are you nourishing? Is it Mm -hmm. nourishing? If you're eating a salad, what are you nourishing? Is it nourishing? If you're scrolling through Instagram, what are you nourishing? You don't always have to have an hour to yourself to make a nourishing choice. We have choices that we make every single moment of every single day almost. And so if you can train your brain to just pause for a second, for a breath and go, what am I nourishing? That will get you through most things. What am I nourishing? Yeah. I love that. That should be the great, like end of 2022. What am I nourishing? And then decide what you're going to nourish for 2023. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I love that. How one last question as we're wrapping up and then we're going to talk about how people can find you and your amazing freebie and your coaching consult that you're going to talk about too. So if you had an unlimited budget, what would you do right now to make the biggest impact on the health and welfare of the planet? (sighs) Oh, that's a genius question. (laughs) If I had an unlimited budget, you know, my honest answer, 
I would start a relentless ad campaign against social media, <laughs> which sounds crazy, but that right. is truly what I would do. Yeah. It is, man, social media does so much good for us, right? It connects us and all of these things, but it, it is destroying us. It's destroying us as a culture. It's like ripping apart our fabric of humanity and what it mm-hmm. needs to be a human. And yeah, if I had an unlimited budget, I would start a relentless campaign against <laughs> social media, which is funny because I'm on social media and I'm going to tell you to follow me on social media in a minute, but, <laughs> right, but. Yeah, one of, but seriously, one of the yeah. things that I have done recently is, so I have my normal phone that has social media and all of that for work. And then I literally have a Sabbath phone and it has mm. text message and phone call. And that is it. That's and it. Mm. it is like peace for my soul. And I notice myself going to that phone and picking it up ready to scroll. And then there's no apps on it. And it's this, Oh, You're thank like, yes, goodness. I know. Yeah, but- yeah. And if we think back, it's not a nostalgia thing and there's science behind it, but we were healthier and better off without social media. If mm-hmm. I can get you off social, I clients tell me now I'm rambling. Sorry. Clients <laughs> tell me all the time. I don't have time to go for a walk and I'll ask them how much time do you spend on social media? And they'll go, I don't know, maybe 30 minutes and say, okay, I want you to open the screen time on your phone and tell me that. And they'll open it and they'll be like, oh, six hours. <laughs> Six hours. No kidding. That's like an average. And (laughs) I say, okay, if you could have, yeah, if you could have six hours of your life back, what could you do? They're like, well, I could meal prep and I could work out. Like, Mm -hmm. you need an hour a week to work out. There you go. Done. Yeah. So if I had unlimited money, I would start a relentless campaign against social media. Yeah, that's so amazing. I like that so much. I was at this concert recently. And when we went to the concert, they, you had to, they took our phones away and every person's phone, it went into a little like bag that was sealed up. So there was no, no phones for hours we were there for like seven hours. Cause it was like oh. this big, this a big event and everybody was just like hanging out and talking yeah. and they weren't like looking down. It was, I was like, Wow, I rem- I was I felt nostalgic. <laughs> I was like, this is what this is what it was like. And it was a really I loved it that the main artist chose that piece to have in the show. And it was, yeah. So I, I think there is awesome. gonna have to be a new balance <laughs> yep. created. Yeah. So yes, I'll be on that campaign. <laughs> cool. Awesome. <laughs> Let's oh, do it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Great. Okay. So Hallie, tell us how the listeners can find you. Would tell us yep. about your amazing free coaching consult that you're offering. And then also you have a super amazing freebie too. So tell us about all that. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So www.livenourishedcoaching.com, best place to find us. On that website, we have a link to schedule a free consult with us. So if you're curious about gut health or changing your lifestyle, or you are a busy mom and you're drowning, just come talk to us and we'll help you figure out that next step, whether it's working with us or working with someone else or drinking more water, but yeah, book that free consult. <laughs> we are on Instagram at live nourished coaching.com. Oh no. At live nourished coaching, <laughs> live nourished coaching.com is our website at live nourished is our Instagram. We're on Facebook as well. And then if you click on the link specifically in the show notes here, and let me know that you heard us on Dr. Lulu's podcast and you decide to work with us, you'll get 20% off of any program that you want. And then we're also going to send you a free gut healing recipe guide. So a cookbook with gut healing recipes in it. And then also a guide to finding high quality supplements in your grocery stores so that you Mm. know what you're putting in your body. So two pretty awesome freebies link in the show notes. Fabulous. Love that. Thank you so much. That's great. And thanks again for coming on today and talking. I loved our conversation. Me too. Dr. Lulu, this is wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Hallie.